Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 94 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. Hey, this week we are joined by a great friend of mine, fantasy and sci-fi author Dan Brigman. Uh, he's going to be reading from his debut book, The Alterator's Light. It's a fantastic read, and I, it's one I'm just so proud of him about, and even more excited that I got a chance to bring him on the show. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be coming up here in just a moment. So it is early in the morning. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell that in my voice. Normally, I don't sound quite like this. I feel like I'm awake and uh, somewhat energetic, but uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like in my voice, it's not quite coming through yet. But it's also November. Hey, here in America, the holidays are coming up fast. It's just, uh, That season is about to kick off. And uh, But something that did kick off is NaNoWriMo. That's uh, another exciting time of year. I am a participant. So is our guest, Dan Brigman. We're both participants again this year in NaNoWriMo. So far, I'm, I'm a little bit behind schedule with my writing. As far as uh, getting a new book done, I'm, I'm still finishing my first book in the series, my Alien series. I'm finishing that up at the start of the month, but then um, I should be done with that here pretty quick. And then I'm starting book two. And the <laughs> the lofty goal I have is to finish that book this month as well. So, but I've got some downtime getting ready to come up. I've got uh, I've got surgery coming up on Friday this week, so I'll be home for a week uh, recovering from that. And uh, I think I'm gonna have a lot of time to write here real soon. But what about you? Are you uh, are you doing NaNoWriMo? If you are, let me know. Hop over to the NaNoWriMo site. Look me up, Jason A. Meiske. If all you do is search Meiske, M-E-U-S-C-H-K-E, then you should find me. Uh, but you'll know it's me because I've got the link for the show on there. Uh, but of course, you can also head on over to our social media sites at uh, on Facebook and on Twitter. Tweet at me or message me or whatever. And let me know that you're doing NaNoWriMo as well, and tell me how you're doing. I'd, I'd love to be able to tr- uh, cheer you on. This week of November also marks the start of our episode 100 giveaways. That's going to be here quick. And, oh my gosh, I, that it's just amazing how fast this has come up. I mean, this is episode 94 right now, which means, essentially, I have five more episodes. <laughs> five more episodes, five more author readings before I hit 100 and the uh, the big party I'm planning. Uh, some of the giveaways are up and running right now. Head over to, again, our Facebook page or our Twitter and look for the links on, um, just click the link on there to see what you're supposed to do. This is um, running them, uh, being brought to you by Rafflecopter. They're the ones who are handling some of the, uh, you know, the more technical side of the giveaways. But just look for those links. I uh, click on them and you can see how to sign up, whether it's uh, requiring you to make a tweet about something or to just enter your email or something along those lines. But, you know, I'll, I'll make it easy, too. If you can't find these links, just email us at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com and let me know you want in on the giveaways. Uh, there's going to be uh, several of them. I'm running them throughout this month. Uh, before I call it quits on, on all of them, before they all end. And then I've got to get all that information put together and prepared. We'll announce the winners on December 10th. And it will be it'll be fun. It's going to be a mixture of me reading off the winners and some spe- very special guests who uh, have agreed to read some of, the, some of the names as well. So who knows? You could have your name being read by a multi-award winning, you know, international best-selling author. So look for those signups and then tune in December 10th for the uh, 100th episode to see if you are a winner. You're still a winner in my heart, but yeah, you could also win a prize. <laughs> now, speaking of prizes, a lot of these are donated by our sponsors. So let's give them a big thank you real fast. Uh, we're going to start that off with our longtime sponsor, You Store All. Out of Warrensburg, Missouri, You Store All is the premier place for self-storage. If you are looking for a place to store your goods for the maybe for the winter, maybe you're getting ready to go somewhere for months and months at a time, be sure to go to ustoreall.net 
and see all the things they have to offer. They have climate control and non-climate control, two different facilities in the Warrensburg area. They're fully fenced, gated access, you get your own private gate code, more than 60 cameras recording 24 hours a day, and both facilities are run on solar power. So they are a very green, and one of the customer comments I have heard a lot is they're also a very clean facility. So check them out online at ustoral.net. That is spelled the letter U, S-T-O-R-A-L-L dot net. Contact them today. I also want to thank a very special friend of the show, Scrivener. They are the absolute best writing software available. You know, I tout them every week, talk about them online, you know, share them on Facebook, talk about them on Twitter. I just love this writing software and I'm using it right now. Spend a little bit of time right before November sorting out my story that I was working on. And uh, I think before I officially kick off book two in that series here in NaNoWriMo, I'm willing to sort out again. And you know, what's really cool about this is you can actually, my, my point is if you're doing a series, no reason to go through and enter all that again. You just take your information from your characters and move that over to the next book. You copy and paste it. It's, it's, it's very, very simple. Um, and that's what I'm going to be doing. You can bring over all your characters, your settings, you know, places, all that kind of stuff. So there's no reason to sit there for a couple of hours and re-enter all that information. You can you can just do it like that. Uh, you got to check them out online at uh, literatureandlatte.com. And uh, don't forget to also, whenever you go to order your own, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version and then i'm going to give a big shout out to my friends over at popgoestheculture.com they share every episode of this show and they are a lot of fun they've got multiple podcasts running all the time wonderful pop culture blogs uh, that you can click on and read all kinds of celebrity information and opinions and stuff very very cool stuff and uh, i just love uh, there, there's several of their shows that i listen to week in and week out so get on over to popgoestheculture.com and check out what they have today well like i said this week our guest is dan brigman i I'm, i'm just so excited because he is a friend of mine from the local writing group he is also a state park superintendent and a third degree black belt in okinawa shorin ryu karate do I forgot to ask him how to uh, say that, so I'm guessing that's how it is. It seems, I I remember being in Japan and learning how (laughs) some of the language is a little bit different and the uh, emphasis on some of the words, so that could be how you say it, but, you know, if if I'm wrong, I'm sure all of you will let me know. (laughs) Anyway, uh, but yeah, Dan, uh, his debut book, The Alterator's Light, it just came out a couple weeks ago, and uh, let me tell you, I'm just... I'm so excited for him. Uh, this is, it's been a long time coming. He's worked really hard. I've had the privilege of being able to hear bits and pieces of it as he's read it to the group, uh, getting feedback and, you know, seeing this book come together. And uh, it's a, it's really amazing how, uh, when you get to see it from this angle, you know, how you're hearing somebody's putting something together and they're working on it and you're hearing like those first few chapters and all of a sudden, yeah, hey, the book is coming out next week. And it's like, whoa, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh, I had no idea he was that far ahead. But uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And you know, this is going to be a great interview. You're going to really enjoy it. During the interview, we talk about his, uh, his love of fantasy and sci-fi and how he blends magic, um, you know, the fantasy magic in with a little bit of the sci-fi, which was really cool. He has a magic system within within the book that's really, really cool. It's all about... Uh, about all about solar manipulation, which is really cool. I, I had never heard of that form of magic before, so that was a really cool thing. Dan also has a book signing coming up at Reader's World here in Warrensburg on November 16th. It's a Saturday, so get on over there. I will make sure and share the links on uh, about that, and uh, that'll be coming up here real soon. So if, you, if you're in the Missouri area, if you're around anywhere around Warrensburg, uh, a little over a week from now, then uh, you can get on over to Reader's World and check that out. I'm planning to be there. As long as I can walk, I'll, I'm planning to be there as well. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to grab one of his books. So <laughs> I've got the uh, I've got the ebook now, but 
I want to I want to get a uh, paperback so that way he can sign it for me. Um, also, as of this recording, yesterday, November fourth, was his birthday. So, join me in wishing our guest Dan Brigman a very happy birthday, and uh, we're going to get on over to that interview with him right after a word from our sponsor. Happy birthday, Dan. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast. This is a really fun time for me. This is my a first ever for the show. Uh, I'm sitting here in my living room. Fireplace is going. It's a nice, cool fall evening. And I have a guest sci-fi author, Dan Brigman, here with me. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and welcome to my home. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is this is a lot of fun. Uh, unique, getting to try out some, uh, some new microphones and uh, just having a... a a nice sit down. This is a little more comfortable than uh, than my usual things, where I'm looking at a blank screen and I have no idea what somebody could be doing on the other side. But uh, <laughs> it's great to be here. So now, when I pick my nose, then you're going to know what I'm up to. Oh my! Here, so. <laughs> well, you too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, give us a little bit of background. Well, I live in Knob Nasser, which is just right th- down the road from Warrensburg, where you live, and uh, I actually work at the state park at Knob Noster. Uh, I also teach a karate class in Sedalia, Missouri, and uh, in all my spare time that I have, I am a sci-fi and fantasy author. Fantastic. What's really cool for me is that, yeah, and, and you're part of our group. I didn't get to mention that before, but you're part of the writing group that, uh, that I attend to. And I remember a couple of years ago when you started coming, and that's been really special and, and a lot of fun for me to get to see how many in the group have have published since then um and getting to hear your story ideas and how that's grown and then now here we are with uh, i mean you've got one right here in front of us uh the alterator's light this is quite the accomplishment man congratulations well thank you um i i would have to agree the writers of warrensburg group is just so inspiring i th- i think all the folks that um, have been attending regularly have seen a great deal of progress in mm-hmm. the last few years. I know I, since I started coming, it it really helped wake me up to what is available in the publishing world. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it it, it was like destiny. Uh, <laughs> I had heard a podcast that I was really into, a, a writing podcast, and they suggested find a local writing group if there's one. And I had, I'd already been here a couple of years. I had no idea there even was one. And the very next day I saw it in the paper. Mm. Uh, Goldie's ad in the paper about it. So I told my wife, hey, I'm going to go check this out. Um, I'm going to do this after work, so I'll be there for a couple hours. And I was hooked from the first day. There was only like three or four of us there that first time I went. Mm. And we were meeting at uh, the bookstore downtown. But, uh, yeah, I was hooked right away. And just being around people, like-minded people, I think. Uh, You know, all of us struggling to get the words on paper learn how to write and write well, write better than, than we were. Cause I know when I started, I thought I was doing okay. Mm-hmm. And then I get around, uh, you know, like-minded people and I realize, wow, I got a lot to learn. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, I know the book group or the writing group, uh, not only inspired me to continue writing, but then NaNoWriMo each November. Mm. I mean, that just helped me grasp how fast I can write the pace and things like that. And I've seen that affect so many of our uh, fellow members of the group. And then here we're getting ready to do NaNoWriMo again. I know, uh, yeah. In a few weeks. I know it helps me finish the current book, Alterator's Light. And then I'll be working on book two all of November. So that's really exciting. 
Oh my gosh. Yes. That that's, I'm, I'm looking forward to all the events we've got planned and, and it's, it's exciting that both of us are uh, part of the, uh, mm-hmm. the leadership group with that this year. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to, yeah. I'm trying to finish book one of my series so that I can begin book two, but I'm not going to push it really hard. I'm just going, Nope. November 1st comes around. That'll be part of my word count for November. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. So you are a state park superintendent. You spend your days, Part of me wants to say in the woods, but that's not exactly <laughs> correct. Tell us what your what your days are like. Well, um, as a state park superintendent, I actually take care of two parks in Missouri, the part of the Katy Trail and uh, Knob Noster State Park, and each day is vastly different. And that's what I really like about working for state parks as my primary uh, job, career, um, because I can be outside part of a day or a whole day and then the next day I may be in the office trying to do reports on what I may have accomplished out Mm. in the field Mm -hmm. either out on the Katy Trail or back at Nomnoster State Park. We also do a whole kind of special events. We're getting ready for one tomorrow actually. I always say that my job is to help make the park run smoothly for visitors that attend the park um, on a day-to-day basis. I hope you don't actually see any of the staff when you come to visit, just because <laughs> that means you're having a great time and you don't need us to be in your way. Well, it, it's a very well-run park. It's one of my favorite places to go fish. My in-laws come up there and, and uh, they camp now with their RV, mm. uh, have a few times, and it's been really nice uh, being through there. Great. I can't imagine you have a lot of downtime. No, there there is no downtime. We do have what's called an off season where we turn off the water um, throughout most of of the facility, but there's no downtime. We always are working on projects. We've got at the park, we've got over 80 buildings to take care of at the two group camps. And then like I live at the park, so I'm constantly there. But that's also an inspiration for me because I can look out my uh, window while I'm writing and see nature. And it helps inspire the epic fantasy or the science fiction that I'm working on. And I think that's, uh, well, with my question a while ago, I think that's what I was trying to get at was that you like to, your science fiction, although it is science fiction, you like to write stories that speak to humanity's relationship with nature, Mm -hmm. which is a really interesting combination. Speak to us about that. Well. Um, Growing up, I had always spent time outside. I had seen the effects that humans have on nature. I grew up part of my childhood on a farm, so I was able to to actually be with nature and reap the benefits of of the work we did outside. And then I've also lived in, in large cities, and I've seen the effects that humans have on the environment with the things that, that have to be done in an urban environment. So throughout my stories, either the fantasy side or the science fiction side, I try to um, use the experiences I've had and also the things I've learned as a state park employee to try to help folks that may not get outside as often to see the effects that we do have on our environment. Okay. And that, coming from the science fiction part of that then, so you get to kind of take real world catastrophes and imagine a sci-fi way to fix that or maybe... Well, I guess like in this case, your your book is um, it's future based, right? It's after catastrophe. It set um, this this book, The Alterator's Light. It is set far in the future. Um, that's kind of a spoiler, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, but it yeah, it is set quite a quite a bit um, past a um, basically an apocalyptic event. I wouldn't call it a post apocalyptic event um, in this book because it's. The, the setting of the Alterator's Light is set thousands of years into our future. So the event that caused the world to change has been so far in the past that the people have already moved past it and are um, learning how to, have already learned how to adjust mm. to what they need to do. I and see. and the, the whole idea behind um, the Alterator's Light, the basis behind the magic system is that the, the people, the Alterators, who are in essence wizards, are able to alter their environment um, through the skills that they've learned. Usually they would have to go to um, like a university or they can also learn it from another alterator just one-on-one. Hmm. Okay. That's, that's really fascinating. And I love that you've got, it's, it's not just um, science and machines or whatever, but it's also a, a form of magic mixed mm-hmm. in with it. So that's, that's a really cool aspect to it. Is that something you can speak about? How how the magic 
uh, plays into this, or how did that come about? Yeah, the magic in the alterator's light, uh, the alterators are what are considered the good folks that they will heal, they will um, change the environment to maybe re remove cold, um, say if it's a winter setting and you come across someone that's freezing to death, they can alter the environment around the freezing person and heat up the air mm -hmm. and maybe the soil, the stones around them to create a more uh, environment that they're able to live through and survive. But there's also a counterpoint with that, that it, if they change the air around them to to where they want it to be, it could cause a serious side effect where you, you cause it to... Uh, Maybe if you're trying to heat the air around you that to too much of an extent that it could cause a severe backlash. Mm. Um, also with healing, they're able to... Buy, and the whole idea is, is they're creating... They're writing runes in the air that's essentially manipulating solar energy. And by writing the runes in the air, it focuses the energy into the manipulation of the environment that they, they want. And... Like I said, the, the healing portion, if they heal a person too much, it could actually end up backlashing on onto the alterator, or it could even kill the person that they're trying to heal. Oh, wow. So. Wow. Okay. It's not like some magic that you see in, in movies or TV where it's uh, you, you, it, there's no cost to, to it. This has this magic comes with a cost. Yes. Yes, it does. It, it can cause um, extreme amounts of devastation or it could cause a harvest to be perfect or exceed everyone's expectations. Because that's part of it, too. The folks in this world have learned how to uh, manipulate crops to maximize yields. Because that's part of our, our own history and also going into our own futures. We're running into issues with the population um, where we are not growing enough food, basically, to to uh, feed everyone on the planet. So these people have already kind of worked around that by using alteration to maximize things like food output, as well as also getting rid of a lot of, of the diseases that we have encountered in our own lives. Hmm. Okay. Now, where do you, I mean, you, you have your inspiration in your love of the outdoors, but where does an idea like this, like how, how did something like this come from? Or is it just part of your love for, sci-fi and then mixing them together well it's um i've read i grew up reading um, fantasy and science fiction uh, and all the various magic systems that you might see in those uh settings like robert jordan um patrick rothfuss terry goodkind terry brooks things like that where you see different types of magic i had always read those and ab absorbed their systems so to speak and I tried to formulate one that would be unique to the alterator's light. And I thought, you know, manipulating solar energy isn't something that you've really seen in any of the fantasy or sci-fi books that I've, uh, that I've read personally. Mm -hmm. um, now, on the other flip side of the alterators, there's folks called blighters who basically have learned alteration, but they're using it for more nefarious things. Okay. They may use... Their runes that they're creating to kill people, um, or cause a crop to completely fail, or they create diseases that can't be healed naturally. It's basically they're creating an Ebola virus um, that no one can deal with, and it may cause it to um, to mutate and things like that. So you've got the it's kind of a yin and yang situation where you've got the alterators and the blighters. Oh, that's fascinating. So I love it. And so you've got your, it's not just a story of dealing with the environment and, and trying to live in this world, but you've also got the bad guys who are up to no good and they can do magic too. And this is, oh my gosh, this sounds amazing. And, and I, <laughs> it was cool. It's like, I've gotten to see a lot of this come along over mm -hmm. the last year or yeah. so and getting to see it come together. But it's fun being in this position now because I get to hear more about it. And, uh, you know, really dive into it even more before I get to dive into the book itself. Yeah, great. Well, what's coming? What's coming next? This is part of a series, right? Yes, uh, the Alterator's Light is book one in the Rune Cycle. Uh, it's going to be a trilogy. The second book is called The Blighter's Shadow, and then the third book's uh, title is the, called The Originators of Saun. 
and that'll tie up the, the whole series. Now, depending on how well everything goes with the, this first trilogy, I may go into a second and third. That seems to be a typical thing for most fantasy and sci-fi authors. But I want to get this first trilogy uh, completed and see if I'm inspired to move on even further. But I, my goal is to finish the trilogy so it's a whole piece. Because a lot of series, on the other hand, like George R. R. Martin, Robert Jordan, folks like that, their books go on and on and on and <laughs> on, and people don't really see an end point. Mm -hmm. And from a reader's perspective, uh, I like to know where this is ending. Like, is yeah. this going to end at book three, or are we going to be strung along for ten books type of thing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, try I'm promising that it's going to be a three-book series, uh, at least for the rune cycle. Oh, my gosh. That's good. That's good. And that's something <laughs> I can, I can speak for myself on, on this as far as I, the series I'm working on, I have a very vague idea of how I might end it, but right now I'm just going to get going with it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I've got it written down somewhere so that it's like, uh, maybe I'll work towards that. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that's gotta be a good feeling to know. Yeah, this is exactly what's going to happen. It's going to end like this. So <laughs> now it could change when I get to book three. I haven't even started that one. Now, I've started book two, but book three is a little bit far off from now. <laughs> oh my gosh! But I've got the final piece in mind. Nice. Do you is uh, sci-fi? You think uh, what you'll you'll stick with going forward? Continue with the sci-fi. No, um, I I consider myself more of a, a science fiction and fantasy. Um, this series is. It does have elements of science fiction, but it tends to uh, skew towards fantasy. Mm. But I am also, um, because of the magic part, I mean, when you think magic, you're thinking fantasy. But mm -hmm. there is the science fiction component, too. So I consider it kind of a mix of the two. I do have another uh, series that I'm working on. I actually started it last year's NaNoWriMo, um, where I had come up with the idea of how all of this got started in our time frame, except it's set about 150 years from our current Oh, okay. Year. Yeah. So that I'm kind of setting up, you know, what happened to create the world of the Alterator's Light. So the initial books for that series will be more science fiction based, whereas the Alterator's Light and the Rune Cycle will be more fantasy based. Okay. So it's creating like a, uh, I think of it a kind of a neat mix of the two genres. Yeah. Okay, and almost like the sci the science is leading towards the abilities of uh, the fantasy and, and, mm -hmm. and leading into it. So, okay, yeah, that sounds really cool. Yeah, do you have a timeline for book two? Do you know? Well, now that I know all the little components of getting a book finalized and getting it published, I'm hoping about two years from now. Um, the Alterator's Light is a little bit over six hundred pages. So with my full-time job and um, the, the karate school that I help run, it, I just look at my time frame, and it's about two years is mm. what I'm hoping for. Okay. Now that, I'm, now that I've got the first book out, I want to keep people excited and look forward <laughs> to the next one. I don't want to wait five mm -hmm. or ten years. <laughs> so. Yeah. But you've got uh, like some short stories and blogs I see you do on your website as well. I do have one. Um, I actually have the prologue for The Alterator's Light up. It's called The Point of Woes. And it is on Amazon um, just as an ebook. It's only about 30 pages. It was actually the uh, prologue for The Alterator's Light. But I had taken it out because it was, it was kind of disconnected from the main story of The Alterator's Light. So I wanted to offer it as a secondary option for readers to be able to pursue. Um, now, the, the other story that I was mentioning earlier with set in our time period, so to speak, it will be, those will be novels. And I hope, I don't know how I'm going to have those in there. I'd like to finish this trilogy first and mm -hmm. then focus on a different project. But I may switch gears after book two is over with just to offer readers a different perspective yeah, of the yeah. whole grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, speaking of the website, where, where can people find you and, and follow you? Um, I do have a website. It is danbrigman.com. And then I am on Amazon, of course, as Dan Brigman. And then uh, on Facebook, you can find me under Dan Brigman, um, comma, author. Fantastic. And we'll make sure and put uh, links to all of that in the show notes. So everybody, after you hear the the sample chapter then make sure you pull the episode back up and and you can click in there and uh, of course we got a 
picture of what the book looks like. If you're on YouTube or if you're at the website, you can see what all this looks like. And lots of uh, fantastic things coming ahead from uh, from uh, Mr. Bergman. And I, I'm looking forward to this. I really can't wait. I'm as one of your your friends and and partners in the club. I'm just really proud of you and really happy for you. So this Thank is you. this has been really exciting uh, to be a part of, and uh, I'm I'm really happy that uh, that you're here today with this. Well, I'm happy to be here too, and I really appreciate all the help you, that you've provided over the past few years at the writers group and things like this. I really <laughs> appreciate it. Well, thank you. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here and uh, listen to the story and drink my drink my drink. Um, you can imagine what I'm drinking here, um, <laughs> and we're <laughs> we're gonna just listen to Dan Brigman with the Alterator's Light. So I'm going to read part of chapter one. Chapter one, The Darkness. Einar paced through the open woodland, his mind preoccupied with thoughts he could not rid himself of, thoughts of doubt and indecision not at his consciousness, threatening to devour him. Long ago, the act of walking became the only way to prevent the effects from taking permanent hold. Something about the movement of his legs occasionally fought off the insanity, yet... Einar's incessant fear for his sanity nearly consumed him. Fifteen years had passed since the first lapse into a world of his creation within his mind. Why has this darkness taken hold? The question had hung ever-present in his mind since that first moment many years ago. The bitter cold of the late winter afternoon carried Einar back to the reality around him. Lately, he had fallen into lapses of deep introspection with the external world evaporating for days at a time. Once, he recalled with vagueness, in the middle of the night, he had found himself staggering through ice-covered puddles in a grove of red oaks near his hometown. Elia questioned his actions over the following month, but Einar could give her no satisfying response. Even his own children had become frightened of his behavior. No words, just their small, dejected faces that furthered his lapses into the wilds. Soul's last rays burst through the low gray clouds, blinding Einar's dark brown, almost black eyes. Gods! Einar silently berated himself as it had happened again. He gazed down through the rays after images, his shoulder-length brown hair hanging down and blocking some of the glare. A blanket of snow up to his shins compounded the irritation as his torn and ragged brown leather boots offered little to protect his feet. Einar inhaled until he could pull in nothing more. The air's crispness brought a shiver to his already cold form. Tiny snowflakes glittering in the sunlight floated downward upon his clothes and face as he leaned upon a huge burr oak. Still blinking from the harshness of the sun's reappearance, Einar squinted upward at dead leaves attached to the oak's branches. Aside from the rustling of the snow upon the leaves, his panting further broke the grove's silence. This walk must have been tiring. Each breath came faster than usual, forming wispy white clouds. What should have been rough bark of the oak had been rubbed smooth from years of his leanings. Einar calmed his breathing. Based on his feet and his clean-shaven face's numbness, he needed to get home hastily, or he would likely lose some flesh to frostbite. Not to mention that Elia is going to be livid. Again. Einar remained within the small grove of massive bur oaks, letting its solace give him a moment of respite. The grove blended into a large forest south of the town he had grown up in for part of his childhood. Of late, Einar had been drawn to the grove for reasons he could not understand. The pull felt strange at first, yet he could not deny its power. Besides, the grove had become a kind of childhood friend. He had spent many hours reading, napping, and contemplating under its ancient canopy. Finally, he pushed away from the tree and began striding quickly back to town. He was no stranger to the cold, Yet Einar did not want his body to suffer longer than necessary for his mental breakdowns. Elia had been bothered by his sudden loss of appetite, muttering about his thinness. He had to work this out on his own, because even she did not understand the voices that plagued his mind. How could she understand? Every time I bring the voices up, she changes the subject. The despondent thoughts overshadowed his life. The snow tapered off, and when he could see the town's narrow stone walls, wider rays of the sun shone through the gray clouds. Chimney smoke trailed into the sky, disappearing into the grayness above. Einar had felt warmth return to his feet minutes after leaving the grove. Spring offered promises of its arrival, yet crisp winter wind still bit at his exposed skin. He stifled a yell when a deep throbbing erupted within his feet. Einar absently scribed several simple lines in the air. 
His index finger formed the rune's four lines into a diamond. A faint, white, translucent trail from each line left its own afterimage. Einar smelled rain permeate the air, and the scent grew stronger with each line. The rune floated, each of its fine lines straight, and each the width of his finger. A breath later, the diamond faded away. The ambient light of the sun faded as the hair on his neck and arms prickled. The power formed within him, and Einar hunched down to rub the tops of his boots. The coldness inflicting his body dissipated as he stood. Einar ignored the runic balance imposed by nature, the relief too palpable. The coldness is gone, Einar mumbled under his breath. His absent-mindedness had caused him to almost forget the most useful gift he had. His colleagues believed his powers as an alterator to be weak. All I need is something useful out here. It is enough to push off the winter's bitterness for a short time, he thought dismally. Enough to make it back to Dirk's Pass. The thought rolled through his mind over the next fifteen minutes of pushing through the thinly packed snow toward town. As Einar reached the East Gate's expansive drawbridge, his worn leather soles thumped across the thick oaken crossbeams. Two guards stood watch, holding two items, a spear taller than the man who reached Einar's shoulder, and a large rectangular wooden shield painted with the Lord Mayor's insignia of three longswords crossed at the middle of their blades. A green tunic with the same insignia embroidered in white thread on the right shoulder covered the chain shirt worn by each guard. Tight-fitting black woolen trousers protected their legs from the cold. Despite the thick wool, Einar noticed that they stamped their feet from time to time. The steel helmets covered just the tops of their skulls and ears to hide nothing of the man and, and woman's faces. Vought and Janie? Einar felt the names slide away. The man, Vought, rolled his eyes as he caught sight of Einar's meager boots. Disdain in Vought's voice struck Einar as the guard asked, How are your feet, Master Amakir? He paused, looking up at Einar's tanned face. I trust the cold didn't seep too deeply into your flesh on the trek. Einar heard the opposite guard chuckle, which brought small plumes of breath into the cold air. Will the disrespect ever go away? Einar wondered. Hope for the prospect of respect had died long ago, yet he still asked. Einar said nothing, passing by them without a word, and offered only a nod of recognition. Not many people were out this late in the afternoon. Dinner time held a strict following. The few citizens who did notice Einar scoffed or laughed heartily upon noticing his nearly bare feet. Only one small child running some last-minute yet urgent errand offered a look of concern before running by. Einar picked his pace up and soon reached his small, comfortable home. Despite his poor reputation, he made a decent wage working as an alterator and a bookbinder. Einar paused twenty paces from the front door. No smoke trailed upward from his home. Odd, he thought. Elia would be finishing dinner for the children. Einar shrugged. At the door, he tried to turn the wooden knob. When it did not turn, he muttered, why has she locked it? Einar reached into a small leather pouch and pulled out a rusted key. He failed to remember the last time he had used it. Confounded woman, she knows it's cold out here, he mumbled as he inserted the key and turned the knob. The door hinges creaked from a lack of oil, and when Einar opened the door, he noticed a stark contrast of whiteness upon the stained oaken table, even in the darkened room. The whiteness looked like a sheet of parchment. Elia's precise touch was accented by the sheet on the table's middle. The table sat in the exact center of the room, with the six chairs spaced evenly around it. Strange. Elia and the children were nowhere to be seen or heard. He held his breath and listened for their familiar voices. Where are they? Einar crossed the room to the square table in a blink and grasped for the parchment. The dark room offered little light. By the open doorway, he caught the day's last sunlight and recognized Elia's handwriting. He sighed while mouthing the words, Einar. We're no longer living in this house. Your actions are too erratic for the children and me. Your mind is a foreign thing. You barely remember anything I say. When you return from the trips to the woods and the library for days, you leave us in fear for your safety, despite what you say. I'll not live in fear any longer. When you think you have changed for the better, you know where to contact me. Einar stared outward, vision blurred, as the letter slipped from his fingers floating downward. He moved to sit at the table before the letter found a spot upon the clean floor. His mind raced with worry intermingled with anger. What have I done? Those cursed wanderings plaguing me for years have culminated in the ruin of what I love most. My family is the only reason for existing. They are gone because of me. Einar sat silently until near-complete darkness fell over the house like a shroud. Faint light from one of the moons and the stars shone downward onto the town. 
Illumination reflected off the white and brown flagstones, but the room seemed to push back the light. Curious. The thought punctured his mental fugue. He raised an eyebrow, and to the darkness, Einar pointedly stated, I must find answers to my mental deficiencies. What mental deficiencies? asked a voice from within the darkness. And that was Dan Brigman reading a sample chapter from his debut book, The Alterator's Light. Oh my gosh, that was fantastic. Uh, it was a great cliffhanger, so you're probably wondering, like I am, of what's going on. Who was that other voice? Click the links in the show notes so that you can follow Dan and order his book. And uh, don't forget to sign up for his newsletter so that you never miss out on what's going on with him. Also, click the link in the show notes for our uh, friends and sponsors alike. And don't forget to click that subscribe button so that next week you don't miss out for a new author, a new book, and a new sample chapter. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again real soon. And happy birthday, Dan. <laughs>